So welcome to all of you in the room this morning and those of you who are watching on Channel 81 and maybe a few watching actually on YouTube. Uh, we're grateful for the time to uh, meet and to uh, talk and to see the wonders of God at work in human history. We see them in the Bible, but Jesus in the Bible tells us, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we can track that. We can actually see that happening in human history. If anybody needs a visible witness that Jesus Christ is alive and well, all you have to do is point to the living church. There is no way to explain the church without the living presence and power of the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection power at work in the church. And the testimony that that bears. You can have world religions moving around and doing all kinds of things. But in order for Christianity to flourish and thrive, there has to be the living presence of Christ doing his work and regenerating us and sanctifying us and leading us in his path and building his church as he goes. Well, as I said in the email <coughs> that I sent accompanying this outline, we have watched Christ build his church from the Middle East in Jerusalem down into Africa and up into Asia, into South uh, uh, West, South Central Asia, and then over onto the European continent and all the way up to Scotland. Right? And actually, we didn't talk about it, but even into Denmark and, or into uh, Iceland and uh, what's the other little island up there that I can't remember. In any case, the presence of God working. But something extraordinary happens when we get to the 1600s. In the late 1500s, Spanish Catholic missionaries crossed into what was then what would become Canada and the peninsula that would become Florida. And so we see these kinds of things happening. But the Protestant Christianity that we have been tracking in the development of its development in Europe comes to the what would be the Virginia colony and the Massachusetts Bay colony right, in the early 1600s. And we'll begin a direction as one historian of American religion wrote in a book for a general audience. He was not writing for Christians, writing for general audience. He said, you may think that I spent a whole lot more time talking about reformed Protestant Christianity than I should have. But the simple fact is you can't understand America and American history if you don't know that. It's like the major cultural religious influence in the early stages and development of America, all the way up into the 20th century. And if you don't know that, then you don't know much about American history. And that was his comment about that. He himself is a Christian. I know him personally. Uh, he is himself a Christian. And, uh, you know, he was, he was simply trying to be straightforward with his non-Christian audience and readers in this general book that he wrote. And so it is that that... Reformed Christianity that we tracked into England and spent time with last week is what comes across the Atlantic Ocean. First of all, in the very early 1600s, 1607, 1609, uh, to Virginia, and then later, 1620 and 1630, uh, to uh, what would become the state of Massachusetts. Uh, at that point, by the way, in 1620, it was still officially a part of the Virginia colony, right, that had been granted to a group of merchants to establish a trading post on the James River. We know the, the name of the little town as Jamestown, right? Because King James was then, King James I, was then the king of England. And we'll come to that in just a minute. But I'm going to start with two scriptures, <clears throat> both in the book of Matthew, in the 10th chapter first, and then dropping back to uh, chapter 5. Jesus is giving his disciples directions and telling them that they're going to be persecuted. But here's what he says to them in chapter 10 at verse 23. When you're persecuted in one place, flee to another. And they took that quite literally. So when Stephen got stoned and the persecution broke out, what did the disciples do? Except for the apostles. They all took off. Right? And the church began to spread directly as a consequence of persecution. And persecution we saw repeatedly happened in various stages and places where the church was. And when people spread, the gospel went with them. 
It became a means of Christ building his church. You think, oh boy, this is it. It's going to destroy the church. And in fact, it did exactly the opposite. It spread the church. And the incredible wisdom of God and the way in which God works. And it still astounds us right down to the present time. I mean, I'm just, you know, I've taught this, this material before uh, in, in different ways, different places, different times. <coughs> and I'm astounded, again, afresh, anew, with what God has done, is doing, and will continue to do till Jesus comes. We don't know when that will be, but he is coming. So draw back then to chapter 5. This is the part of the uh, Sermon on the, the Mount. But verse 14 has a particular phrase that becomes important in American history. You are the light of the world, Jesus says to his disciples. A town built or set in the King James Version on a hill cannot be hidden. Right? And it will become central to the settling of the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630. And it will become central to Ronald Reagan's presidency. Mm -hmm. right? And so right on down to the present time. This concept of our nation as a city set on a hill. But more specifically, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a visible demonstration of Christ building his church. That doesn't mean that everybody in that visible church is saved or belongs to the body of Christ. But nonetheless... There's the living work of Christ going on. And that notion, the distinction between those who are in the visible body, but not in the invisible body, is of course a part of church history from day one, right on up to the present day. But I did want to read these two scriptures as a way of getting us started uh, with the things that we, uh, we need to do. So I don't have any more green lights, so we'll just keep going here. I'll put it on, put it on my Bible, and you'll hear it vibrate if it, if it goes off. You'll hear it vibrate. Well, French and Spanish Catholic missionaries, I'm at the outline now, uh, came to North America before English Protestant settlers came to Virginia and England. And here's the key distinction. The missionaries came to convert and to come before trappers, and various kinds of traders. There was no intention of establishing a colony in the sense of people would come, they would build up the colony and integrate others into that colony. There was none of that thinking taking place in the Spanish mind. The few colonists that did follow in Spanish and French missionaries usually built up powerful elite societies over which they ruled and everybody else, the indigenous peoples, Everybody else was under them, quite different to the English Protestants who worked very hard to bring the gospel to Native Americans and to other peoples. The long, sordid history of what happens in that is another, another matter that we won't spend time with. But uh, the point here is that there's a very <coughs> distinct difference between settlers and those who are not. The latter, that is Virginia and New England, uh, the Protestant settlers, came to establish colonies and to establish permanent residence. The English separatists in 1620 and the Puritans in 1630, they were later in America collapsed into one group and the general term uh, Puritan is used uh, for them. Came here seeking freedom from persecution and from the limitations of religious freedom. Some hoped that conditions in England would change and they would go back home. But soon they began to realize, and many others saw already, that their future was here in the new world and the future of their children and their families on in to the future, whatever that might may be. So Jamestown, Virginia is the first place in 1607. It was from the settlers from the Church of England. And there's an interesting kind of thing that happens in that. Uh, try to find which tag I need for this. I should have put these in different places on the page. That would help me. This has to do with the settling of Jamestown. And what do you do about pastures? <coughs> if you settle and your intent here is to maintain the presence of the uh, Church of England. And the decision would have to be, you would have to have priests 
in the Anglican Church, ministers from the Anglican Church, to come to North America. Well, Jamestown was a small settlement, never stable because they had pretty bad relations with Indians over a course of time. And uh, it, uh, it made it a very different settlement. Plus, the farmland was upriver. And so most of the people scattered out. So Jamestown was never a very successful place. And so the question then of what do you do if you believe, as the Anglican Church did, in the concept of apostolic secession. It means that every minister must be ordained and laid hands on by an ordained bishop within the Anglican Church. The idea of apostolic secession, of course, came from the Roman Church. But what would you do then if a man here in the colonies decided that he was called to be an Anglican priest? Here's the answer. That the preservation and purity and unity of doctrine, this is the discussion that went on in how we we're going to solve this problem. Uh, this is written in uh, 1642. So we're a few years out, but they're facing now this question of the priesthood in the Anglican Church, what we would call the Episcopalian Church, and will come to be called that in the United States. That for the preservation of purity and unity of doctrine and discipline in the church, with the capital C, the Church of England, and the right administration of the sacraments, only an ordained priest could administer the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper in particular. No ministers are to be admitted to officiate in this country, that is in Virginia, but shall, but such as shall produce to the governor a testimonial that he hath received his ordination from some bishop in England. So you want to be a priest? Buy yourself a ticket back to England? Go to London, get ordained, and then come back. Dangerous, expensive, time-consuming. Right? Who was willing to do that? Virtually nobody was the answer to that question. And then, they show, so when they get back, they have to subscribe to be conformable. That is, they will you know, commit themselves to the orders and constitutions of the Church of England and to the laws that have been established upon which the governor is requested to induct the minister into any such parish and make a presentation of them. If, on the other hand, he goes on to say, he's unwilling to do that, then don't admit him to the priesthood. If he continues to preach, banish him. Right? And so what you see here is the beginning. Was that mine? No? No green light yet. <laughs> and so the... the Church of England was being established then in the same way in relationship to government that it stood in England. So these were not people separating from the Church of England. They were not people being persecuted by the leaders of the Church of England or the English government. But these were people who were going to perpetuate both the king's rule and the rule of the Archbishop of Canterbury of the Church of England. It would establish the Anglican Church right down to the present day, uh, present day, the Episcopal Church. The concept of Episcopal or Episcopos, a bishop, right? So that you have a church ordered under the bishops and administered the authority of pastors under the authority of bishops. And so it retained a certain Catholic structure except under the monarch of England as distinct from the papacy. That was Henry VIII's thing. I'm going to be the head of the church in England. Right? Ended up being the church of England. But to this day, Charles the, what is it, Charles IV is the current king, I think, of England. Charles IV technically is the head of the church in England. Soon after this movement of Henry VIII in the 1500s, uh, there was a movement afoot to allow the bishops to have more control over the church. By the time we get to the 20th century, few of the English monarchs attempted to control the church, but participated in it in various kinds of ways, especially Queen Elizabeth II. But we'll leave that. That's another matter altogether. What about the Episcopal Church then? In the United States, it would become a church ordered under bishops in relationship to the Archbishop of Canterbury. And it remains true right down to the present day. Okay. 
So what happens here in Virginia, in uh, Jamestown in 1607, and then through the 1600s, right, would have a profound impact on the direction that America uh, developed. But later, there were people in England, Protestants, who wanted to separate from the Anglican Church, not be a part of it, not try to reform it, simply to leave it and establish their own organization and their own sense of direction. These separatists were seen then not only as divisive in terms of the church in England, but also of the kingdom, because they refused to have their religion under the control of the monarch. So they were seen politically then as dangerous, not just as religiously dangerous. They wanted to have their own churches and congregations. And they then were called separatists, wanting to separate from them. And they were persecuted. So they discovered that in Protestant Holland, they could go. The, the Holland people, the people of the Netherlands, would allow them to come in. But they set limits on what they could do. They could not take jobs that were used by the wealthier people in Holland. All they could have were the menial jobs if they were available. And then they could create their own crafts and sell them if anybody would buy them. And so life was very miserable for these separatists who lived in Holland. And so in 1607, or excuse me, 1617, they began thinking about, uh, and let's see, find the right, right place here. Okay, come on, where did you go? Here you are. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Actually, I can read this piece better if I do it out of this book. Okay, this has to do with the separatists who came to uh, Cape Cod. They went, weren't aiming for Cape Cod. <laughs> they were aiming for the northern part of Virginia. Jamestown was a long uh, colony running up the coast and deep colony running back into the interior off of the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. And so the separatists got permission to come to northern Virginia. So that, that's where they were headed. You remember this tale from school, don't you? They were headed for uh, Virginia, but they got blown off course. And they ended up on Cape Cod and then went over across the bay and created uh, the Plymouth Colony uh, there. And uh, I remember standing there and the park ranger insisting, no, this rock right here, this rock is the very rock on which they set foot. <laughs> I was a bit skeptical of that, but she believed it. And so I said, okay, fine. You wear the uniform, I don't. <laughs> uh, many of you have been there and seen Plymouth Rock and all the story that is behind that. But the important part here has to do with the fact that for roughly a dozen years, many of the separatists lived in Holland and life became increasingly difficult. Their children were forbidden to go to the schools because it overcrowded the school. That part of Holland was quite uh, populous, and so there were so many limitations placed on them. So when William Bradford, one of the signers, by the way, of the uh, Mayflower Compact, and we'll come to that uh, when we get there in just a moment, wrote a, a uh, history of the, the uh, what was then called the Plymouth Colony, right? Uh, and uh, Plymouth Plantation Street, 1620 to 1647. 1620 was when it was formed. 1647, it officially was absorbed into the Massachusetts Bay Colony and became a part of the what would later become the state of Massachusetts. But when asked the question, uh, Bradford, why did you and others leave and go to the wilderness, right? The expression, the, an errand into the wilderness. They went on an errand. They were doing something. They were going somewhere with a specific purpose in mind. Not just fleeing persecution, but rather there was a larger purpose that they had. So what other kinds of things? He says, well, first of all, he gives four reasons here. Why did they leave Holland? By the way, they had to get special permission to return to England long enough to get the Mayflower 
in shape and head for uh, North America. Uh, they had to get permission to do that. Thankfully, they had a friend in high places who could get that taken care of uh, because they weren't allowed to go back to England under pain of, uh, in some cases, execution, in most cases, imprisonment. But in any case, they got permission, so they're on the way. Why did you go? First, the Puritans there found, out of 12 years of experience, the hardness of the place and the country to be such as few in comparison would come to them. So they aren't going to build an English colony in Holland. People aren't going to come over there and live in the conditions. And the church, by the way, had already been planted there, of course. The Protestant church was already there. And so they decided, no, we can't have this. Even our children aren't able to work and to grow and have schools. And so we're the ones who bear the difficulties. But what about the years to come? Already, 10, 11, 12 years past, many of us who came over from England are now here in Holland and we're aging. And we can't work as hard as we used to. So our families aren't being provided for. Our children don't want to work this hard. Right? We came because we had a purpose. But our children have been brought up under better circumstances. And so they're going to have now to stoop to doing the same things we're doing. Menial jobs. All these kinds of things. They weren't accepted in the society. Not only that third thing he says, our children who are so dear to us, right, are the ones, in fact, who are subjected to the evil of the other group. There was a great deal, even though that part of Holland was Protestant, there was a great deal of licentious, licentiousness among the youth. And so the children of the separatists were being exposed to that by their peers. And so we've got to do something for our children. We can't just leave them. They can't work this hard. They're exposed to this kind of evil. We have to do something. That, those are the first three kinds of things. But then what he says, number four, watch what happens. Last, but not least, a great hope and inward zeal they had of laying some good foundation or at least to make some way thereunto for the propagating and advancing the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in those remote parts of the world. That is, that on that coast of northern Virginia, we can plant the gospel and build the kingdom of God, relating church and kingdom together here. We can build a church. In other words, it had an evangelistic goal. The goal is to build the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. True, they were fleeing from persecution. True, they're fleeing from very difficult circumstances. But it's not just trying to get away. They have a goal in getting away. That is to continue to propagate the gospel and to uh, carry on. And so we see the Lord Jesus Christ building his church. Some of the key leaders here. Um, and the, as I said, they were blown off course. They landed on Cape Cod, but then went over to the mainland. Uh, key leaders, John Robinson, who was the pastor of the church in Leiden, where they were in Holland. John Robinson, by the way, went back to England, but he did not come to the colony. He stayed. The key people here for the, for the colony were William Brewster and William Bradford, whose book I was uh, reading from. Right? When they figured out where they were, that they were not under the rule of the Virginia colony. What did they do? They were no longer under the laws of England, so they decided to make a form of constitution called the Mayflower Compact. It's very short, not a lengthy piece at all, uh, and I think I can... Uh, which book is it in? <laughs> I should put colored tabs on my notes also. You my no, I've got okay. I've got mine here, Charles. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Yours might actually be easier to read than mine, but <laughs> but I've got this one uh, before me here. So what did they do to do while they were still on the Mayflower before they uh, most of them got off? They had the the crew had gotten off and rode the boat around, found out where they were, whatnot. But before they uh, got on uh, land, they decided to work up this compact, an agreement among them. And this is the way we will govern ourselves. And so here's what it says. In the name of God, amen. 
We whose names are underwritten, 41 names. We don't have the original list. This list was made by one of the members of the Mayflower, or of the uh, Plymouth Plantation, about 20 years later. So he was doing it from memory and from the memory of others. Uh, but we have 41 names of the men who signed, uh, who are the underwritten. The, these are the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign, Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc., all these various titles. Having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith, we consciously know what we're doing here. This is our purpose, to advance the Christian faith. And for the honor of king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. Do by these presents, solemnly and mutually, in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and the furtherance of the ends foresaid. We have a civil government for what purpose? To advance the church. If you don't have civil order, it's very difficult to advance the church. The necessity of civil order. And that's why it's difficult in nations where civil order breaks down to maintain the life of the church. You have to be pretty intentional to keep the life of the church going. Right? Now, the Lord does it, of course, and he's done it repeatedly down through history. But they're conscious of the fact that they need to do this. So this is what they're doing. And so they enact this and uh, constitute and frame just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, and constitutions. And so are for the general good of the colony. And then they uh, close out, sign their names to it. This little document, short as it is, became the forerunner of much else in American political life, establishing freedom of religion, free to practice religion. Now, unfortunately, the separatists, as well as others, wanted freedom for themselves, but they weren't too excited about some other people. Right? And so the question of do you extend religious freedom, the right not only to believe, but to practice your religion to those who are different than you. This will take us right down to 19, or to 2023. We're still thinking about this problem. Okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about it in a moment. But the point here is that watch what happens in this. Even though they're coming for freedom of religion, they cannot get away from the fact that they do have to have civil government. And so the question in Reformed Christianity had been from day one, what is the relationship of the church to the state? Right? Roman Catholicism had a form for that. Lutheranism had a form for that. Right? The Church of England would have a form for that. How do government and church relate to each other? And so we can't get away from that. That constant blending of power of church, power of state, how do we deal with it? But the Lord Jesus Christ keeps building his church. Even though these are serious matters, they have to be thought about, have to be given careful attention to, and we're doing it right down to the present day. Some of the Supreme Court cases that are coming up this uh, session will deal with church-state kinds of relationships. They're rarely ever free from that and dealing uh, with that. And so, uh, the Mayflower uh, Compact. Uh, ten years will pass. And the Puritans, the Puritans differed from the separatists in this. They wanted to continue reforming the Church of England. They wanted to get rid of the Catholic elements. So they wanted to do away with bishops, for example, and have pastors and local congregations under their authority. They wanted to do away with that. They wanted to do away with vestments. They wanted to do away with the sacraments as practiced by the church and have those freer and to be administered by lay people if need be. So they wanted to purify the church and hence Puritans, but to remain in the church. They didn't want to do away with the Anglican church. They wanted to separate it from, separate it from. So the separatists didn't like them. You people are unwilling. Neither did the Baptists and the Quakers like them, right? the Puritans. Right? And yet what happens will become primary again to America. They had a key leader in England, a man who was actually a practicing lawyer, named John Winthrop. 
Winthrop was not <coughs> a pastor. He was a layman. And he is on one of the ships coming over uh, and will be elected the first governor when they get here and serve as governor off and on for about 25 or 30 years, uh, something like that. But it's Winthrop who will give expression because of his facility with the language and his legal understanding to so much of what will become important for the building of the church in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the Puritan structure, which will remain in place for quite a long period of time, more than 100 years uh, in, uh, in Massachusetts. Okay. When they were coming across the uh, ocean and the first of the three ships, the lead ship, um, what's his face, Winthrop was on that ship. And he realized that what they were doing was, to, was coming to establish a community. A community that would incorporate the church but not everybody on those three ships were Christians. They knew that. And so how could they incorporate into a society? What would that society need to be in order to incorporate even unbelievers, but under the law? The believers, unbelievers were free to stay there, but they had to be obedient to the law. How then would the Christians behave in that kind of context? And so he structured a sermon that he called a model, spelled with two L's, M-O-D-E-L-L, -L, a model of Christian charity. In other words, what would it look like? You build a model of a village, and you put down the little rocks where they are supposed to be, and the Lego house where it's supposed to be. That's a model. Right? In other words, it's an image of what will this look like. And so the uh, looking like for uh, Christian charity uh, again, by the way, they have to give an explanation for why they're going to leave. Let me just read briefly what Winthrop says about why the Puritans choose to leave England. Uh, first of all, he says, it will be the service of the church of great consequence to carry the gospel into those parts of northern Virginia where they think they're going. Right? Or I'm sorry. No, they know they're coming to Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Bay Colony the gospel into these parts of the world to help on the coming of the fullness of the Gentiles. What is he quoting? Paul says in Romans uh, 11, when the fullness of the Gentiles come in, then what? Christ comes and all Israel will be saved. In order, he says, for the coming of the fullness of the Gentiles and to raise... And watch what he says here. The bulwark against the kingdom of Antichrist, which the Jesuits labor to rear up in these parts. The constant fear among the Protestants in the 13 colonies was that Roman Catholicism would get a foothold. Right? And so the struggle to do everything you could to prevent that from coming. For them, building the church was building the church that they knew and understood. Right? and saw the Catholic Church as Antichrist. The favor was returned. The Catholics saw the Protestants as Antichrist, Luther and all of those subsequent to him. And so he says, this is our purpose. But not only that, during the time now that we're talking about here in the 1620s and into the 1630s, the Thirty Years' War had broken out in Europe, or was about to break out, the wars of religion, and they were horrific, right? The, the amount of destruction carried on as Protestants killed Protestants, Catholics killed Protestants, everybody killed everybody else, and lots of people just having fun by murdering, raping, by stealing, and, and this war went on so, so long. And so he says, the second major thing, it may be, who knows, but what God hath provided this place, Massachusetts Bay Colony, as a refuge for many whom he means to save out of the general calamity of Europe. When Winthrop thought this would go so far as Europe itself would be virtually overthrown. So where would the church continue to lead forward the building of the kingdom in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, he thought. And so he said, how are we then, if that's true, how are we to construct our lives together? 
And so he preached this sermon called A Model of Christian Charity. <clears throat> it's quite a lengthy sermon. It's well worth reading. If you ever find a full copy of it, uh, you may get weary in the first few pages. He doesn't write like we read. <laughs> so we have to learn to read like he writes. <coughs> but in any case, uh, it's well worth reading. But here are some of the things that he says. First of all, the end is to improve our lives to do more service to the Lord for the comfort and the increase of the body of Christ. And we are members of that body. But in order to be true to each other and true to God, we cannot be phony. We, can, we must have love unfeigned, as Paul puts it in Romans. We must love each other and sense that our brotherhood is an important part of our relationship. And so they will build into that community an idea that will, will stay in American <coughs> thought right down to the present day. The concept that we are brothers, the brotherhood of man. Where do they get that idea? And the answer in America is here, right? From the model of Christian charity. And he will do it. So then he says, and here's where the city set on the hill uh, comes in. <clears throat> it's not in this passage I'm going to read. It had come just before. it. So here's the way it stands between God and us. We are entered into a covenant. He's talking now to the people on the ships. Uh, the covenant with God to do his work. And we've taken out a commission. The Lord has given us leave to draw up our own articles. And we have professed to enterprise these actions upon these uh, principles and these ends. And we have thereupon besought him with favor and blessing. Now if the Lord shall be pleased to hear us out and bring us in peace to the place we desire, then he hath ratified this covenant and sealed our commission and he will expect us to perform the articles the ends of which we have profounded without dissembling with our God. And if we do do that, if we begin dissembling with God and fall away and embrace the present world and prosecute our carnal intentions, rather than seeking the things of God, we seek our things, then we're going to have to answer for it. And that's where he uses earlier on in, in the, the uh, sermon, the city set on a hill. In other words, the city set on a hill that God will build will be a city of testimony. But if we turn away from God, it will be a city of destruction. And everybody will see it. And they will know that these people were false to the covenant that they made with God. And the importance of that idea in American culture and civilization. But the point here is, not that it is a political concept. It didn't start that way. It starts and remains as an important statement about the church in relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they wanted to do. And we'll see more about that next week. No other nation, to my knowledge at least, in the, in the history of the church, has experienced what has repeatedly happened in the United States starting in the 1700s. Right? We call them awakenings. Right? Great revivals, huge revivals, taking place in very lots of different places across the nation. And we can track them. We'll track some of them. We'll try to track them all in the United States. They're essentially what they call three great awakenings in American history. The first one we'll pick up next week because it's connected with a guy named Jonathan Edwards. And we'll, we'll come to that. So what do we have here then? The city set on the hill, the model of Christian charity. But there were others who came too that neither the separatists nor the Puritans wanted here. Right? The Quakers for one group. Right? How do you know that? In 1659 through 1661, four Quakers were hanged in Boston publicly. We don't want you. They were hanged. In four separate occasions, they hanged a Quaker. Right? Also, we know they didn't like Baptists. Why? Because Roger Williams was a Baptist. And he kept saying to them, you ought to baptize children. The only people who get baptized are adults who consent. Right? That's who you baptize, not children. Right? And besides, you baptize adults by immersion, not by sprinkling a little water on their heads. Right? And so 
he, instead of being hanged, two, uh, three of his peers, by the way, were beaten later on. Uh, and the letter that he writes here is a response uh, to that. Okay. And so Baptists weren't welcome in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Okay. Quakers weren't welcomed in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But there was an opportunity for Quakers. There was this piece of land that nobody really wanted. But a wealthy nobleman in Europe named William Penn decided to buy it. And he bought it. And he established a Quaker community. So you can come. But not only if you're Quaker. If you happen to be Moravian Brethren, for example, you can come. Or if you happen to be atheist, that's okay. You can come. You just obey the laws. So Penn set up the laws, and then he began to discuss, what's the issue here that's so crucial? In the Massachusetts Bay Colony, you had to believe, right? If you were going to practice a religion, you had to believe what was believed there. You had no liberty of conscience. And so Penn's argument is, you have to have liberty of conscience. It goes back in European history to what was called the Anabaptist movement. The only Anabaptists we have here, well, two groups. Um, the Mennonites are the most notable ones. The small groups of Amish are a spinoff also of the Anabaptist group. But they believed in liberty of conscience. So one Anabaptist pastor, by the way, in Germany, who was a woman. Her husband had died and the church asked her to take it over. She said, the government has no right to coerce our conscience. Our conscience is free before God. Sounds very much like some guy standing before the diet of worms, diet of worms in Germany and saying, my conscience is bound to the word of God. It is neither right nor safe to deny conscience. And so these people, Quakers and Baptists, said, no, our conscience is bound to our understanding of the word of God and we ought to be free to receive it. And Penn says what we need is a colony where that freedom of conscience is recognized. And so right now, Jack Phillips, once more, third time around in Colorado, is fighting for the freedom of conscience. Because it means not only I can believe what I want, I can live by what I believe. It's not an obscure complex, it's a very complex question. It's an obscure question that happened back there somewhere. It is a living question right down to this moment in time. But Penn created this colony. We call it now Pennsylvania, obviously, right? The importance of freedom of conscience and, and liberty of conscience. Well, so what do we have here? Roger Williams, the Baptist, right? Williams, by the way, did not say a Baptist. I'm not sure of the story of that. I've read it, but I've forgotten it. It's too many years ago since I read that part of the story. I didn't go back and reread everything. I simply don't have time to. Uh, <clears throat> but anything, the point here is that Roger Williams kept saying to the leaders of the Massachusetts Bay uh, Colony, it's not right to baptize children. That's not the way it ought to be done. And so, in order to have freedom of conscience, you would have to say, okay, you pastors, you can make up your mind. You can read the scriptures and decide, do we baptize children or adults only? Right? No, instead, they said, Williams, shut up or leave. So in 1635, they drove him out of the colony, and he went down to the little space that was in there called Rhode Island. And there established a colony and built around the concept, again, of liberty of conscience. So what happens when his friends back in the Massachusetts Bay Colony were beaten and imprisoned? Right? Williams is absolutely outraged. And so he writes a letter to the then governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, a man named John Endicott, about religious liberty. And he says about that, and, and there's lots here that I could read, but I won't. He says to him, I speak of conscience, a persuasion fixed in the mind and heart of man, which enforces him to judge, as Paul said of himself, 
a persecutor. And to do so, and so with respect to God and his worship of God. In other words, he has the right to understand himself before God and then respond to God directly according to the scriptures. And he lays this out. And so he levels this charge against him, against the governor. If you remain dangerous, then the combat that you're carrying on is like the combat of potsherds broken into the earth with the potter himself, a capital P, right? With the potter himself. And it is going to be a dismal battle for you in order to carry that on. Because the dreadful voice from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will say, and watch what he does with this quotation from the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. Endicott, Endicott, why huntest thou me? Why imprisonest thou me? Why finest? Why so bloodily whippest? Why shouldst thou, do not I hold thy bloody hands, hang and burn me? You see, Paul, why, why do you persecute me, Paul, for speaking to the governor right, as to what he is doing? Sir, I must be humbly bold to say, tis impossible for any man or men to maintain their Christ Watch now what he, how he brings this down to the church. To maintain their Christ by their sword and to worship the true Christ. The Christ, right, which you try to impose by using coercive power and the punishing power of the government is not the Christ. Right? That Christ, the true Christ, right, does not fight against conscience but draws conscience to himself. And the one then, the governor, that who allows that freedom of conscience, <coughs> excuse me, allows the precious life of the true Lord Jesus Christ to be proclaimed and to be made available to people. And so this, this mixture of things, always behind it, is the, the promotion, the allowing of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to build the church. I will build my church. It's such a messy thing. Right? This building of the church. Mm -hmm. The people get saved. Right? right down to the present time. In the United States, the, the missionary force second to the Assemblies of God, Southern Baptists. Right? The missionary force in home missions, Southern Baptists. Right? The aggressive reaching out for the knowledge of Christ promoting his church. And so we see it here. So why has America become, why did it become in the 19th century, the greatest missionary sending force on the face of the earth? We'll talk about that later. But the truth here is that the Lord Jesus Christ builds his church. If persecution breaks out, he's got it. One way or another, it may be the testimony of those in prison, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Uh, right? That goes all the way back to the 2nd century A.D., that statement. And here we have it. Christ's way of building his church. How amazing. How wonderful. And as Paul says about those who crucified Christ, the leaders, if they had known what they were doing, they wouldn't have done it. <laughs> and so it is. If they knew what they were doing, they wouldn't do it. Allowing that freedom of conscience, the liberty of conscience, for us to practice the gospel, to live the gospel. And Kathy and I pray through the missionary uh, prayer list every day. We pray that not only will the gospel be free, but that people will be free to hear it and free to live it. Amen. To live the gospel. Because it is a community of charity. It is a community living in the love of Christ Jesus. He's building his church, not only in numbers, not only in places, but building us up in the love of Christ Jesus and the love of the Father. Isn't that amazing? That is utterly amazing. Thank you, Father, for your wonderful grace and goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you.